um, now John Zagier, who's a local, is going to uh, talk on holomorphic quantum modular forms. So, thank you. I'm very sleepy and have an infection with one ear not working. So if there are questions, I will choose which ear and only hear <laughs> the ones that I know the answer. <laughs> so I will also speak much more solidly beautiful because I'm exhausted and tired. So I'm sorry to disappoint people who want to quickly. So I'm glad that so many people came. You're obviously curious what the hell my title means. And I'm also very curious. My favorite American expression is, how do I know what I think until I hear what I say? And it's a little like that. This is a concept that's been evolved. And I'm telling you the current version of it. So in 2010, I wrote a paper called Quantum Modular Forms, which is a very unusual paper, math paper, in that it's about 10 or 12 pages long. Not only there are no theorems, I don't prove anything at all, but there's also no definition. I never in this paper say what quantum modular form is. I introduce them. It's a new object. Many people, including quite a few in this room, have studied them, sometimes giving different interpretations or somewhat different than what I did mind. But it was not a precise definition. It was a concept. A quantum modular form is a function that has a certain characteristic property. And I gave six examples of very, very different natures where the specific description of what the property was differed from case to case. I wanted the word to apply to all of them. It's a little like the notion of a group. We have already things like finite groups and Lie groups, which are quite different, but at least, OK, a group is a set with an operation. But we also have things like algebraic groups that aren't groups, or formal groups that also aren't groups. So we still call them algebraic groups, formal groups, because the notion, the, the psychological feeling is the same. It's like a group. And so quantum multiple forms is a bit like that. So what a usual multiple form is, First of all, everyone knows, and second, you were on the previous lecture, and it is uh, uh, refute your some group, uh, which might be SL2Z or maybe some other uh, subgroup of SL2R, discrete and with finite covolume, and for, you have some function, f, of a variable uh, tau. And let's just call it z. And then the if it's a modular function, it's simply invariant under the action. So this is the usual action if my matrix, this is a two by two matrix of determinant one. If I call the entries a, b, c, and d, this is the usual. Uh, if, if tau is that, then this is a, c plus b over c, c plus d. And the function is this. Or maybe there's an automorphic factor so without the fact it's called a multiple function. If it's a multiple form, it has a weight. All of this was uh, reviewed in the previous uh, talk and is well known. And there might be characters and various other details that I don't want to go into. So in other words, if I define a group action, f slash gamma, this is an action actually of a ball of SL2R. Uh, but let's just do it for gamma and gamma. Well, no, let's do it for f and g. And this means f slash <coughs> gamma is the function of z, which is, if we have this automorphic factor, we have to remove it, and then f and a c plus g over c c plus d. And then the uh, condition is that f <coughs> is equal to f slash gamma. So that's a usual modular form. Now, in this paper, I defined these quantum modular forms. And roughly, f, so this function usually is, so in, in the classical case, of course, f goes from the upper half plane. This is what I learned from Hillsborough, just to use German letters for the upper half plane. So this is the set of z. It's imaginary form is positive. So in France, it's called the Poincaré plane, but in Germany, they managed to discover the upper half of the plane without anybody telling me. <laughs> and so this is classically a holomorphic function in the upper half plane, which, which has this transformation law. OK, so what I did, I mean, there were, as I said, several examples, five or six examples in this paper, 
from very different domains of mathematics. Maybe there were six, four of them came in some way from ordinary molecular forms, but not so ordinary. One came from the Eisenstein series of weight two, which is quasi molecular. One came from the uh, uh, mass form with eigenvalue of quarter. Another came from actual mass forms. Another one came from mock molecular forms. Another one, I think that's more than four already, came from the uh, either integrals of molecular forms. So those examples, you started with the usual molecular form, did something to make a new function, and that function was a function still in the upper half plane. But as you know, let's say the group is SL2Z, SL2Z, so I'm just back in England, so I've forgotten how to speak English. It, uh, the cusps of SL2Z are the rational points, so Z goes down to the rational point, you have something. And so if you have a function that's actually modular or related to a modular form, either integrals or some other thing, mod modular form, something that's maybe not quite modular, then you can look at its asymptotic behavior as you approach rational points as you go to the cusp. Of course, that includes the point of infinity. So it's really E1 and Q. And then it will inherit some kind of modular properties. And so four of the accounts were like that. But the really interesting ones were the functions which had a kind of a modular property only on the rational numbers, uh, but did not, as far as we know, came, come from anything with modular properties in the upper half plane. And so that's the theme today, to what extent one can imply that. So this function is, uh, well, I can put it's continuous in the discrete topology on, uh, on Q. It's the only reason for the I do not take the topology on Q as a subspace of R. So the numbers 10 and 10 plus a million are very far apart. Well, of course, this is an empty property. Every function is continuous in the discrete topology. So we have an arbitrary function, and typically, uh, here, I, I don't have a projector, so I can't show the graph, but here's the graph of one of these functions. Of course, even from where you sit, you can see that the graph uh, it's kind of right. <laughs> It's not a beautiful kind of look. It looks like that. If you want to look, I have a great look at the So this is just kind of a random function. And now if I ask that f, and maybe there's a weight, it might be zero, it might be some some other number, k. Okay? So let's not worry too much about that. I now look at the difference, f slash gamma minus f. Now, to ask that it's zero, as I did before, would be completely idiotic. Because the group, let's say the group is SL2z. The group <coughs> SL2z acts. By the way, this function may be uh, not defined at finite in many points, so s finite, or something like that. But let's not worry about details. But it's almost everywhere to find function. <coughs> so, and therefore, it doesn't matter if I include infinity or not in, in my p1. <coughs> So when I look at this difference, if I ask this to be zero, that'd be idiotic, because the group SL2Z acts transitively on the rational numbers. So if this were zero, then the value at every point would be fixed by a single value, and it would be at most a one-dimensional space, actually zero-dimensional. So that would be a good thing. But the notion was this. We look at R gamma, uh, RF gamma. This will be now a co-cycle, so RF will be a function from gamma into, let's say, like in the case, well, it will be functions on Q, on B1 Q. And now this difference, this will be a co-cycle, so this will be RF, will be a co-cycle, and this class will be homology class with gamma, with, uh, you know, with coefficients, with some such representation of functions on P1 of Q. But now this function, should be better behaved. So as I said, there was not a precise definition because I want to allow a lot of freedom that every function of this type will be seen as quantum modular form. This should be better behaved and Sorry? Sorry? What's your I certainly can, but only after I've written because I'm vertically impaired with the challenge, as they call it. OK, so uh, there it is. So what is better behaved? Well, there's not much to be better since this function was arbitrary. The graph was random. But in the example that I just showed you, you can't see unless you're in the front row or some lucky people being in front of the front row in lay. There's one graph which looks like, like this. But this was evidence. But then in the case of, uh, in the case of SL2Z, there are only two uh, functions. 
uh, to a generator of group SL2 Z. It's minus, I'm sorry, I should have called it Z, but now I'm thinking of X as in the reals, well, actually in the, in the reals and the rationals. So I'm thinking of the lemma. So this was a function divided rationally. It had this group. It is periodic. So whatever this, there was actually a little internal structure in this so the points are a little group, but still there. So it's a periodic function. But it's not invariant under minus under x, which is the other generator. But I say, if it were invariant, then, so if I call this now, uh, uh, well, I mean, literally it would be Rs, uh, sorry, Rf of s, where s is the standard notation for the generator 0 minus 1, 1, 0, SL2z. This function, when I draw, draw its graph, it looks like this. It's not quite a continuous function. It is infinitely many jumps. It actually jumps by a finite amount at all rational points. So the points of discontinuity are dense, at least experimentally. But at irrational points, it's left and right continuous. And at rational points, although it jumps, it's actually C infinity experimentally for the right and left. So it's a very nice function. But whatever it is, it's a function. The graph of this is one dimension. If you take the closure of the graph, you get a curve. And except for the jumps, where you would have to choose the value, this defines a value, uh, a function on R. So this becomes a function uh, from R uh, to, in this case, R. Whereas before, it was only defined on Q. And you couldn't possibly extend this to R. There's no kind of continuity. It wouldn't extend. Sorry. So that's what I meant in that case by the adverb. And let's see. There's a question. What is the graph on the left and what is the graph on the right, please? This is, I, I think I said it, but didn't write it. This is the uh, original function, which is just uh, is just a random graph. And this is uh, f of x minus f of minus 1 of x. So as I say, there are two differences. One of them is 0, and the other is a function which extends to r. So that was the basic definition. And this last example actually came to quite input from quantum topology, from the so-called Ashai invariant, and I hope very much at the end of the lecture to return to it. But now I want to extend. And so what I realized two years ago, partly uh, alone, partially in John, John work with John Lewis, also with work on topology with Stavros Scarfalidis and a couple of other co-workers now. But several times, I saw that there were functions that had a similar kind of behavior, but now they're holomorphic quantum modular forms. So now, I again want that f is defined in, let's say, the upper half plane and holomorphic. And now it's not, there's some weight k, so I won't write it. I mean, there's there's some homomorphic factor, it might be <coughs> just f of gamma tau, it might be c tau plus d to some power times f of tau. If you look at this difference, so let's call this analytic, complex analytic. Is there an example of an explicit uh, function of which for, for which you have this property that... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I just showed it to you. I, I said there were six, there were six numerical examples of the paper in great detail. And I draw, drew the graph of the last one. I mean, I can tell you the function, but it would take several minutes. But yeah, it's full of examples. That's where the theory came from. That there are many, many examples. It's a phenomenon that now appears in many, many different places. So quantum open forms are everywhere. To coin a phrase. No, no. Th and this particular one, I mean, this graph that I showed you was draw drawn by computer, not by telepathy. It really took the points. It's a well-defined function of the American values. OK. So remember the notion of quantum modular net that f is not invariant under the group, but the difference between f and f slash gamma, f circle gamma, in the simplest case, that difference has better analyticity properties than it had. Now, in the case of a function that had no analyticity properties at all, it was just a random graph, it wasn't hard to get better. Even piecewise continuous did the job. And this example is piecewise continuous. But that was the sixth example. The first two or three, it was piecewise real analytic. So it was a beautiful function with only finitely many jumps. So I don't, as I said, I don't want to specify exactly what I mean by better analytic properties. But that's the key word. I, I don't know if I wrote, yeah, better behaved analytically. So here, 
I now define a holomorphic function of the upper half plane to be a holomorphic quantum of four. I wish that it's a better word. Somebody can think of it. I've been trying for months to think of something nice and snappy, but I couldn't. We want that the difference is more, is better behaved analytically. So first one thinks, how is that possible? A function that's holomorphic. That's as far as it goes. You have continuous and differentiable. For complex functions, once it's differentiable, it's holomorphic. It doesn't get much more analytic than that. Well, constant maybe or polynomial, but we don't want that. So can somebody who hasn't heard me explain this before and really doesn't know, suggest what could it mean for a holomorphic function to be more and to become more analytic? On the boundary, on the boundary. The well, not just the boundary. Remember, Weierstrass, you have a function, and it's a holomorphic function in some domain. Then you take a point. There's a power series that converges there, but now you take another point here, and maybe that power series converges in bigger domain, and you can analytically continue. And so, if if you have u and u prime, then a holomorphic function in u. Uh, sorry, u prime gives a holomorphic function on u, and that map is injective. But there's no reason that a function here should belong to that smaller, much smaller space. So more analytic means analytic in a bigger region, maybe on the boundary, but beyond. I want beyond. The, I want holomorphic. So once on the boundary, it has to be in a small neighborhood. So i.e. holomorphic in a bigger area, in a bigger domain. Now this would be a completely pointless definition if there weren't examples, but of course there are. So I'm going to give you a couple, and then I hope to get to the example coming from topology at the end. It's a much more subtle thing. It does not satisfy this definition, but it's in the same scheme of ideas, and it was actually then like the example that really uh, forced uh, one to look at this more detail. So let's take example zero. And this is very convenient, because I can use the uh, uh, I take MK, I can even take MK, it doesn't have to be cusp forms. I can use the previous talk by Young Zhou. I take a, a, a multiple form on SL2Z or any other group, and then I take F tilde is the so called hyper integral. Mm -hmm. That's not unique, so there are, there are several, and this is equal to K minus first. Primitive. So if you remember from first year calculus, the primitive of the function is like <coughs> having that function as its derivative, but it's not unique. You can have a constant integration. So here we want that uh, the k minus first derivative of f tilde equals f. And of course, there's no problem doing that since the upper half plane is simply connected. You can integrate f once, and then again, you could do it k minus one times. And the freedom of this, of course, is you can add a polynomial. So I can set f tilde plus a polynomial, where p of z is a polynomial of degree at most k minus 2. That's the freedom. And now the theory of periods, which was the theory of uh, uh, Eichler and Schmur and Mani later, says that if you take this thing, but you don't slash the weight, so f was in weight k. So f slash weight k now is equal to f. But now you slash f tilde in weight 2 minus k with gamma. And then this thing, let's call this rf of gamma, it's still a function of z. Right? I mean, this is a function of z, that's a function of z. But in fact, it's a polynomial in z. So that certainly contains polynomials in z in the upper half plane extend, uh, well, three polynomials is much stronger, but in particular they extend holomorphically to all of z, and even meromorphically, if you wish, to all of uh, P1C. So that's so that's kind of a dull example. So I could define a holomorphic quantum of the form as a function f, which here would have been f tilde, which in some way it satisfies f slash gamma minus f is holomorphic in the whole complex plane. But that's too restrictive. As far as I know, this is the only reasonable example. So I don't want that. But my first interesting example will be the Eisenstein series. on SL2Z, but of odd weight. So before I write that, I'll move the board up in a second, but first I'll write, before I move it out of reach, uh, let me make a formal definition here. Why so, do you, 
why do you use the word quantum? I don't want to go into that now. It's a long story. It comes from quantum invariance as well. So I want to give you a Okay, let's, let's stay with what I'm telling you. It's, it's a good question, but not now. Uh, I mean, the idea is roughly, the idea is that the quantum topologists and the uh, physicists who were doing these invariants always looked, you know, the Q is always e to the 2 pi i z. But they write this e to the h, or maybe h bar they put, it should be h plus the 2 pi. Maybe e to the minus h, so h is going to zero. And then they expand <coughs> perturbatively, and that's my perturbative quantum field here, this Q, h is supposed to be Planck's constant. And then I realized at some point that you can also that, uh, so here, if e to the h, this will tend to 1. So the unit disk, you're tending to 1, and I realized that it makes sense to go to all rational numbers, and therefore in Q to go to all roots of unity, and then it turned out that these, so that was kind of a, a perturbative quantum effect, but I don't, I really don't want to talk about that. Okay, I'm just in the middle of trying to give the definition, a more formal definition. So we call uh, F, so F is again a whole more function uh, in the upper front plane. Actually, all of my functions, all of this come with a partner in the lower half plane. And since the upper and lower half plane are independent, of course, there's no analytic continuation. You could take any function of the upper half plane, any other holomorphic function in the lower end, and say that's a single holomorphic function. But my functions always have a natural partner. And so actually, f is actually a holomorphic function itself. But in fact, in all my examples, it's not just the upper half plane, it's on the upper and lower half plane. So that's the thing. So we call f a quantum, a holomorphic quantum of the form. I won't make an actual definition, which I'll move up in a second. If f minus f slash, again, there could be a weight, and then you have to put that weight here. So f minus f slash gamma. This should be holomorphic not in C, but in C gamma for all gamma in the group. And C gamma is the cut plane. So if I take well, if gamma is the, I'll do it first for the general of C. If gamma is the translation, C gamma is, it shouldn't be anything. Um, the fact that it would be zero. If, uh, there might be a, a factor here. From the but if this is zero minus one over there, then C gamma is what's usually called C prime. It's the cut plane, C prime, which is C minus the closed negative real axis. So here's zero, and you go to the negative axis, and then you take all points which are either the upper and the lower half plane or strictly positive real numbers. So it's a bigger open set. And in general, C gamma, so sorry, C S. So gamma is S, which is this. And if gamma is just gamma, then C gamma, uh, I think I call it C gamma prime, which is suggested to come play. C gamma is C, well, it's the set of z in c, such that c z plus d is the usual top plane. So in other words, I forbid, uh, it's empty if c is 0, but if c is positive or negative, it means I forbid real or negative numbers. So I can draw the picture, and then I'll move this board up. It's just like I did for s, but not from 0 to minus infinity, but from gamma inverse of infinity which is minus d over c to infinity, this is c is positive. Because then the condition is cx plus d should not be negative, which means x should not be to the left of minus d over c. And if c is <coughs> negative, then it's exactly the same picture. But I start with minus d over c, and I come to the plus infinity, and I come in the other direction. <coughs> OK, so then I can even put fact, proposition, uh, the Eisenstein series, which I'll define in a second, of GK, so K is a natural number, this the Eisenstein series of O, or even weight on K, is the quantum multiple form of weight K. So I want to spend a fair amount of time on this example. So, first of all, let me remind you what the Eisenstein series is. 
So if k is again a natural number, then g k of z will be, there's a constant term, which is the Bernoulli number, the k of Bernoulli number divided by 2k, plus the sum n from 1 to infinity, this formula is in one to the next also. Sigma k minus 1 to n cubed n, this is the sum, d divides n, uh, d divides n and is positive, d to the k minus 1. So if you think of the constant term, if n is 0, then the uh, sigma k minus 1 to 0 should be the sum every positive number divides uh, 0, so allowing a little divergence. This would be the Riemann's eta function, and then because it's on the edge, you should put a half. So that's a constant term is uh, bk over minus bk over 2k, which is also a half zeta 1 minus k. This is, of course, some rational number. So as examples, g1 will start minus a quarter plus q plus 2q squared. Every prime has coefficient q. This is his two devices, which is a zero power. But four is three devices, one, two, and four. Uh, g2 is a more familiar one. It's minus 1 over 24 plus q plus uh, now it's the sum of the device of 2, so that's 3, the sum of the device of 3 is 4, the sum of the device of 4 is 7. And G3 would be 0, all of the odd ones will have 0 coefficient except G1, this odd Bernoulli number, no, odd Bernoulli no, number, so it's 0. And this now I have to take 2 squared plus 1, so that's 5 and 3 squared plus 1, then 4 squared plus 2 squared plus 1. Uh, sorry, this is q squared, q cubed, q to the fourth, and so on. So those are the first few. Now we know that if k is even and uh, uh, greater than or equal to 4, then gk is equal to a constant, so the constant doesn't really matter, but it's 2 pi i to the k over uh, k minus 1 factorial. Actually, I have to put that on the left, so I should put it inverse if I put it on the right, so there's a factor. But what we all know is that this is the sum over all integers n and n in uh, z, but except for 0, and then you put mz plus n to the k, except that since k is even, you, you would be counting everything twice since you divide by 2. Okay, so that's the usual definition. And this actually works even if k is 2, except then it's not absolutely conversion, and you have to sum first over n and then over n. And it converges nicely. And as a result, you find that gk slash gamma minus gk is 0, so it's a multiple form if k is 4, 6, or something. But g2 is not, so g2 of gamma tau is equal to c tau <coughs> plus, well, I should put the slash here, c tau plus d squared, actually the way I'm doing it is g tau tau minus that, uh, and now it's minus 2, and then it'll be, I believe it's 1 over 4 pi out, it might be minus, times c over c tau plus d. So in this case, this is not holomorphic in all of c, but it's meromorphic in all of c, it's, you only have to remove one point, p over c. So in this particular case, G2, which is usually called the quasi modular form, is also an example, a really stupid example, of a quantum modular form where the, uh, the failure of modularity is, you know, extends all work to the whole complex plane, except for a pole at minus D over C. Sorry, tau equals Z. I, I changed letters. From now on, if I write tau and Z, I'm probably not so close. Okay, so now what happens if K is odd? So now I claim that gk slash, well, I think I've been doing it this way, it doesn't matter the order, gk minus gk slash gamma weight k will extend homomorphically to this cut plane uh, that I said. So for instance, this would say explicitly g of tau minus tau minus k g of gk of minus 1 over tau will be homomorphic in what I call C prime, which remember is the usual cut play where you cut from zero to minus infinity. So this, uh, so I noticed this two or three years ago, and then I, I learned that there's a paper that was a few months earlier I hadn't seen, although I knew one of the authors by that and in Conray, and they actually have found this also, but I think only in the case 
this case, when, when it's minus 1 over tau and not the general case. So the general case would be c tau plus d to the minus k, dk of uh, gamma tau, a tau plus b over c tau plus d, will be in holomorphic, because well, I already wrote it, I'm writing it out. So it's not a particularly difficult theorem. I would like to suggest to you the proof. Actually, I know four different proofs, even five, because one of them has two variants. So I'm going to sketch you two of them. Uh, all but one are modeled on calculations that I did many years ago with John Lewis in a paper in the Annals for mass model forms, and that will be my example two. So example two is sort of the Eminence cleaves that, that let us, one is knows what's happening here, but it's much harder. I mean, this is a much easier example, so I started with it. So the four proofs are once uh, sums over cones in lattices. So four proofs of this state. Sums over cones in lattices. I'll sketch that. I'll sketch the second one too very briefly. Then inverse Mellon transforms. Yeah. Inverse Mellon transforms. Oh, that's not in my sleep. Okay. Transforms of the uh, products of zeta functions, so zeta products. Then the third one is used in what we call the paper Green's forms. The green forms, green looks like it's the color, so it's called the green forms for mass Eisenstein series. Let's get that completely. And the fourth is Taylor coefficients of the Favier quantum dialogue, which I will talk about later, at least briefly. Okay, so these are the four four ways of getting this. So let me explain first the first one, which is completely elementary. I'll just do it for S because it keeps it easier, but the, it works equally well for, for anything else. OK, so my object is to prove this formula, but I'm looking for the exact same proof works for any gamma. There's no change at all. So I unfortunately just removed the definition, which was still in both definitions. In fact, I should put it back. GK is minus BK over 2K plus the sum sigma K minus 1 with NQ again. And this was before up to a factor which was, let's call it little GK, which is uh, GK. So these were equal up to a factor, which is, I told you, 2 pi I to the K, K. I think I miswrote it. It's 2 pi I to the K over K minus 1 factor. And it might be a sign if, if uh, I forget. So up to that factor, these are the same. And this was the sum. Originally, it was half the sum of 1 over n tau plus n to the k, where tau is z again. Q, of course, I didn't say, but I think everyone knows this and it was in the previous lecture. It's always e to the 2 by tau or e to the 2 by z. So before we took the sum of the whole lattice, the lattice point, and then we divide it by 2, because since k was even, uh, things were coming in pairs, since we divide by 2. If k is odd, this converts perfectly well. If, let's forget the case k equals 1, which needs a special argument. If k is at least 0, then this sum converts, but it converts to 0, because the odd and the even terms. So let me let lambda, let, uh, lambda be z plus z, and then lambda plus be the set of n n with n positive or n is 0 and n is positive. So if I draw a picture, oh, sorry, if I draw a picture, <coughs> it's this. So I'm taking half of the lattice, the upper half of the lattice, the lattice points in the upper Euclidean half plane, and the right half of the unit. So now if I sum, n n in lambda plus, then there's uh, no problem because uh, why is there no problem? There's no problem because there's no problem. Uh, 
First of all, it's translation variant. I mean, let's bear this bad. If m is zero, then this is constant. That's translation variant. If m is not zero, then semi z to c plus one sends n to n plus m. So in the third uh, row, this point will go three units to the right. It's preserved. So this half plane is preserved. So this is certainly translation invariant. And now you do the same calculation as in the usual case. For each positive n, you're summing over all n. That's, that's convergent, absolutely convergent. You sum it to an explicit function. And when you sum those functions, you get this. So this is very easy identity. It's the same proof you usually get. But of course, the problem is that in the usual thing, we're summing over all lattice points up to a factor of 2. Now we're only summing over half of them, because if you took them all, you'd get 0. So if I apply gamma, then when you apply uh, m times gamma z plus m, and remember this is an automorphic factor, so I have to divide by cz plus d to the k. So this will be 1 over m prime z plus m prime uh, to the k, where m prime uh, n prime is the matrix A to C actually transposed uh, times uh, n and n. Okay? So in the usual sum, if you apply an element gamma of the group, you just send the lattice to itself and there's no problem. But now, if you slash, if you take G and subtract by S, then what happens? Well, the original sum, you sum it over the positive lattice points. Right? I'm ignoring the, the end, you have to do something with the edge. And now we subtract, but now we want the, uh, re the reflected points, which if you work it out means that n is negative. And this is n and this is n. Okay, so when you now apply s, which is uh, tau goes to minus, z goes to minus 1 over z, and n goes to n comma minus m, then you send this to this. But if I subtract this from this, then this one is plus one. This is plus one. It cancels. So there's nothing here. Here in this quarter, both were zero. Here this was one, and this is zero, so it's one. And here, this is zero, and this is one, so I get minus one. That's the weighting factor, which is two times the sum, where I put just one here. Except then I put a half on the edges. Right? Because since my k is odd, uh, these terms and this with a minus sign uh, are, are the same. Because minus the thing the k prime is negative, but it was. With a minus sign, it's just double. So what you find is that this thing is equal to 2 times the sum n, n greater than the 0 will open star. Star means you count all the points strictly in the interior, m and n strictly positive, and if one of them is 0, you count it as half a point. And if you're in the corner, I mean in the vertex, you don't count it at all, you put zero. And then it's the same formula, mt plus m to k. But this thing is visibly volumorphic in C prime, we're already finished. Because uh, if m and n are both positive and z is either a complex number with non-trivial imaginary part or a positive real number, then this can never vanish. So we haven't introduced any faults. But if you took z to be, for instance, minus 1 or minus pi, let's say minus pi, then you'd be in many points for m times minus pi. Because then it's very, very small. You'd have arbitrarily large contributions that would diverge. So this function makes sense, but only in the cut plane. And the same proof works in any other lens. You still take this, but then when you apply gamma, you, you have a straight thing like that. And when you subtract, you get a cone minus the opposite cone. It's the same proof. OK, so that's the first proof. The proof one. <coughs> I want to give a second proof using number transforms because it's kind of pretty. So let's take uh, GK tilde of S. So it's the number transform, at least the real part of GK on the imaginary line. Uh, now, there is a way I explained in the appendix to inside this book on quantum field theory. There's a way to define number transforms on a class of functions which is larger than the ones where the integral converges. But here, I'll just subtract the constant term to keep life simple. It's, in this case, it's the same. So if the real part of S is very large, you can say how large, then this thing converts. So that's the null transform. And because this is sigma k minus 1 of n, you find almost immediately it's a standard calculation. It's very easy. The same that you do whether S k is even or odd. It's the product after gamma function of two Riemann zeta functions, zeta s and zeta s, 
shift it to the left. Okay, on this side. So, uh, That's a, the quantum effect. You'll see the previous form is superimposed on the units. Okay, so inverse Mellon transform. So now we, uh, I'm not going to worry about analytic details at all. There are poles and so on. Let me not worry too much. But roughly the idea is that when you take the inverse Mellon transform, so you try to write gk of i y, and therefore later gk of z, where there could be an x plus i y. Then this would be the <coughs> 2 pi i times the integral over real part of s to some constant between t and k, let's say k over 2. And then the g tilde of s is gk tilde of s or gk. The one that I just defined, o times y to the minus s ds. Okay? Now, this thing, because of the known holes and asymptotic growth of the Riemann Zeta function, this is holomorphic, it's, uh, well, it, it's holomorphic because straight there's some poles I'm going to ignore if you cross them, you, you pick up a residue. It's holomorphic and it's got pi over 2 exponential growth on vertical strips. And so it's called from standard estimates to the Riemann zeta function. Then, that means that if you're at a height t, the thing is close to zero, sorry, decay. Uh, that's why it converges. So it's sort of O with B to the minus pi over 2 times T at pi T. Not pi over 2 plus epsilon times epsilon. OK, but now if I take GK of pi Y, maybe I should even put Z here and put here Z over I to the minus S. But now if I take GK of Z minus Z to the minus K, GK of minus 1 over Z, well, z over i will go to its inverse, and it's an extra factor. So what I'll get roughly after a bit of work is gk tilde of s minus, if I got it right, i times gk tilde of k minus s. So when I do the integral on the vertical line, the two ver the, this other one goes on the same vertical line that z has turned into minus 1 over z, which means z to the s has become z to the minus s, but there's a z to the k, so s has become k minus s. That's the usual function equation. But the actual combination you get, so if I call this thing psi, then this would be psi tilde of s. It's the Mellon transform. I do exactly the same thing, restrict to z equals by y, take the Mellon transform. I might get a couple of details wrong. I didn't prepare this carefully. I found all those, but you, you get the idea. And now, you find by a miracle that so gk tilde of s is gk tilde of s times 1. That's not very hard. But the other term, here we have zeta of s and zeta of s minus k plus 1. Here we have zeta of k minus s and zeta of minus s plus 1. But of course, that's the same as zeta of s times zeta of s minus k plus 1 up to gamma factors. So these two functions are the same up to gamma factors. But there are two gamma factors in zeta. Oh, sorry, there's this gamma of s. That becomes gamma of k minus s. And on top of it, there are the gamma factors coming from the functional equation. It's a, a six-line calculation, very boring, with lots of problems of gamma and trigonometric problems. When you do it, you find that the second term, the one that I'm subtracting, is up to a constant, which I hope I got right. Uh, sorry, no, it, it's even simpler. Oh, sorry, it's zero. It, it's this only if k is wrong. Otherwise, it, it's, if k is even, you just get zero. But if k is zero, then you get a constant which is if k is odd. Then the constant where the k is one one four three one four is plus i times tangent of pi z over two, over pi s over two. As I say, each the gamma functions are all different by other gammas. You have the duplication form, the reflection formula. Reflection formula involves sine and 
after some shifts, there's some codes. Some of you work with all that after an eight line computation. But this, I can find this equation, sine is uh, tangent is sine over cosine. And then I have cosine plus i sine, which is e to the pi s over 2. But that's exactly the i over 2 that will cancel uh, this i to the s in the, uh, in the integral. So that actually goes away. And so what I get, I get that psi k of z is equal. I mean, there's 1 over 2 pi, the same thing, the same vertical line, so real part is a half. But now I get, essentially, well, there's uh, if I write it out, it's actually g k tilde s, the same as before, z to the minus s, the s, the, so real part of s is k, is the one of 2 pi i. But here, I have cosine of pi s over 2. But on a vertical line, cosine of pi s over 2 is exponentially big, like e to the pi t over 2. It's in the denominator. So now, this thing has x, uh, it is pi exponential growth on vertical strips of decay. So before, I had a function which at height t was O of the property e to the minus pi over 2t. But now, if divided by e to the value, absolute value of, of y, maybe, if I go up or down. Here, it's the same with, uh, but with, with another e to the pi over 2. But that means that this thing converges. You have to remember with z to the minus s, it's minus e to the minus s log z. So if s is a certain angle, of a certain size, that will mean that it converges before it converged if argument of z over i was less than pi over 2. But now the argument of z, z over i maybe, whatever it is, is less than pi. Before it was pi over 2. But that means that what was a half plane has now turned into a 360 degrees, just missing one angle. And that's the way. So that's the other proof. And I think both are somehow very enlightening. The other two are actually also nice. They're based on uh, these ideas developed in the paper with John Lewis and that Green's form of philosophy, but then applied to the mass as a child series. Okay, so now we have two examples, one kind of trivial one, which is hyper integrals, where the difference, f minus f slash gamma, was just a polynomial, so holomorphic everywhere. And now this uh, example, that's a true example. <coughs> so time is. Uh, my watch has stopped, obviously. I mean, it's, <laughs> it hasn't stopped, it's not the odd. It took a quantum jump ahead. Uh, I haven't got at all to the main points. And I'd like, I'm sort of like a go for a little bit, a little, still only a little, I guess. So, example two, maybe, is from the work with John Lewis. So, let u of z, which is x plus i, y, not a half plane, be a mass waveform. And that means that delta the Laplace operator on u is an eigenvalue, some eigenvalue times u, and that eigenvalue is traditionally written s times 1 minus s, and then let's say it's a cusp form to keep it easy, then there are no constant terms, and then the coefficients will be uh, the k Bessel function, uh, the exact form doesn't matter, you don't have to know what the k Bessel function is. This is whatever you need to satisfy the equation, and then the numerical coefficients. And so this thing is invariant, not simply weight zero, for all of them in my group, which is, let's say, SL2Z. In the original paper with Lewis, that's what we did. But then we associated with that a new function, f of z, which is holomorphic. And as I told you before, it's holomorphic in both the upper and the lower half planes. So in the upper half plane, you take a n q to the n. So any holomorphic function, it's periodic, has a Q expansion. Q is, remember, e to the 2 pi z. But I want n going to plus infinity in order for it to converge. And it turns out to make it work, you have to put a factor. And in the lower half plane, we take the remaining coefficients. I've thrown away half the coefficients. So you take n to the s minus a half, a n q to the n, with n negative, and you put a minus sign. So this is if c is in h, and this is if c is in the lower half plane. OK? So this is this, that's trivial. I could do that for any function. Uh, so if I have any function of a half plane, which is translation invariant, and satisfies this eigenvalue uh, equation, delta u is s times 1 res s u, then by separation of variables, it has a Fourier expansion of this form. And then I can use those very same coefficients, a n, 
and put the positive ones here and the negative ones here and make a holomorphic function both the upper and the lower half plane. And this is the unique correct way to do it. And then our theorem, so this was uh, in our Adams paper in 2001, uh, in the case of SL2Z, that uh, now if you took uh, F of Z, and now you apply, so F of Z, as I said, is, is trivially popular periodic, it's a function of Q. But if I apply minus 1 to Z, there's an automorphic factor, which is Z to the minus 2S, but that makes sense, because Z is in the upper or the lower half plane, and therefore it has a non-zero uh, 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 branch of log, and you can take, you can make a branch of Z to the minus 2S. And what we show is that this thing extends holomorphically to C prime. And what's more, if and only, if you take some numbers, a n of polynomial growth, and write down this thing, then if, and then you write down f with those coefficients, if n extends holomorphic from the upper and lower half plane to the cut plane, then those coefficients a n multiplied by these vessel functions are SL2C invariant. But what we didn't notice, it's the same proof, is that if I take a, A, B, C, D, and S, L, 2, Z, <coughs> usual A, C plus B, then this will also be in the holomorphic thing in the same concept as I said before. And each of the proofs uh, that we gave worked for that. Now, that was only for S, L, 2, Z, where you're using the fact that we have these generators translation minus 1 over Z. And that's why I could do this proof with Mellon transforms. That would not work for a group that does not have, that is not generated by the reflection, whereas the other proof is much more general. But now, uh, naturally, just as in countries, actually we wanted for many years, Lewis and I, to generalize this to other groups, and we would completely stop for many years, and then uh, uh, we added to the team, Rolof, uh, uh, afternoon speaker, uh, Rolof Krohemann, and we worked for another 12 years or so, and we finally finished a proof which turned out to be 130 pages long and was published in the monograph, except that a little lemma that we had to develop was supposed to be 15 pages, we decided to take it out. That grew to another 80-page paper. So it's a 200-page proof. And what we did is we showed that for any nice group, gamma, essentially any group, the mass forms, say cos forms on gamma with the spectral parameter s are I'm going to drop all the details, are isomorphic, just like in young Jung's lecture, to the first cohomology of gamma, with representation now not in polynomials of degree k minus 2, but in the so-called principal series representation, which means it's functions on p1 of r, and the action is in weight minus 2s, uh, which means, or actually plus 2s, I think, which means that it's all just on r, so I'll write x. You, the action is you send phi to this, and there's some business about how to make this make sense of infinity and so on. But roughly, that's called the principal series representation. There are several models, but this is one. And the final theorem was that you had a period map just like the Eidfisch-Schumor map. But it was, it, that was a statement of what we had proved here. Even this proof was not trivial. But it was fairly easy to translate into that. But in general, we had terrible trouble because the usual way of defining this cohomology thing just didn't work. And finally, to do it, that was this uh, appendix that turned into a separate 80-page paper. We had to invent new models of the principal series representation involving sheaves of local solutions of certain families of differential equations. It's a complicated story. We found a new model, and then we showed that you, that, that was isomorphic as representation of this, and that we could produce a code cycle in that. But actually, it's very, very easy, because if I do this now, f is a mass form in spectral parameter s for any gamma. Let's say gamma is translation by 1. So I can use the same notation as this expansion. I don't worry about minus 1 over c. It's not a generator. But f is defined the same way. This not no longer plays a role. That won't be in the group. But this is true by exactly the same proof. And that we kind of knew. That was not new to us. But the problem was, if you try to restrict this, you know, Vs is focused on the real axis. But now, every time I take a gamma, I reach there by f, which is holomorphic in the upper and lower half, and it doesn't cross the line. But then I have my f minus f slash weight 2s gamma, and that uh, extends 
the solo morph that goes to the upper and lower half planes, but now it extends to this cup plane. But that's no good, because that gives me half a function on the real line, and so what you have is a collection of a lot of halves of functions, and you need some kind of a weird sheet to put that all together. And we actually missed a trick. It's completely easy to do. Remember, that, let's say the group is SL20. Any other group such that minus gamma is also in the group. I can always add minus gamma. Well, if, if gamma is ABCD, then minus gamma is four minus signs. C has changed sign. So remember in my definition of the cup plane, <coughs> you come from gamma inverse infinity to minus infinity if C is positive, and the function is defined there. But if C was negative, then you come from the same gamma inverse infinity to infinity, and now it, it's on the other side. But every real number except minus d over c itself is either to the left or to the right of minus d over c. So now we have a perfectly good function, but it's a, it's a cosine for PSL2z. Take a matrix in PSL2 that meets a matrix up to sign. Then in the upper half plane, it acts because AC plus B over CC plus B couldn't care less about the sign. So that acts perfectly well, as we all know, on the upper half plane. The automorphic factor, even when we have an odd weight for it, if I change C and D to the negative, I change the sign. That's not the same number. And if I change the true S, then since I've taken some log, I change the, you know, the, the true pi, well, the true pi I S. So you have to be, gamma and minus gamma are not doing the same thing. But this theorem applies to both of them. They're both in the group. And so one of them gives an analytic continuation that way, and in particular, a germ of a real analytic function to the left of minus d over c. So in the small, it's either whole morph in a small neighborhood, a real a germ, you know, it's a real analytic function. It's, of course, the same. But then if I take the other gamma, one of them, you know, any x is either to the right of minus d over c or to the left, if it's all equal to minus d over c. So I can always change the sign of C to make Cx plus D positive. And then I take the restriction. So you have to be careful. These two functions are not restricted at the same function. One is the restriction of a function that actually extends to this, <coughs> or to this half plane, but I'm only looking at it in terms of here, but it's near, near the real axis. And the other extends to the other half, and I'm only looking at it here. It's not the same function. But still, it's a function. I now have an analytic function defined everywhere. And now you just check that it's a co-cycle. I haven't actually checked completely that it's the same as the one we have. But you don't have to deal with some bizarre way of making co-cycles at all. OK, I've already run over. And the lecture that I wanted to give would have started now, but I'll skip it. <laughs> Maybe the example in the paper on quantum of forms, the one that gave those weird graphs, came from a quantum multiple invariant. And that one is only a quantum upfront in Q. It is not the restriction, as far as I know, of anything coming from the upper half plane. But, in fact, it is a restriction of a combination. And so I'll just tell you, uh, to whet your appetite, for later, that uh, quantum field theory of, of, of a null theory gives many examples. The example gives examples, e.g., g of tau which is some power series that I don't know the coefficients, and g of tau, which is some other power series. I don't know these coefficients may be wrong. I can look them up. These are both homomorphic functions of the upper half plane. And in fact, each one is a natural part of the lower half plane, so they're really homomorphic in C minus R. And neither one is a quantum multiple form. But instead, what you have is that if you take g of gamma tau, and then there's an homomorphic factor, times g of tau, and you add a constant here, it's minus, and then it's there's some other power, times g of tau, g of gamma tau. And this function, for all gamma and gamma prime in the group, does exist, so this is something like gamma inverse gamma prime, and there's some cut plane. So you don't quite, if, if g were a constant, that would just say that g minus g slash gamma extends. But here you have a combination of two functions, and in general it's not two. This one comes from the so-called 4-1 knot. If we take this as the uh, another one, the minus 2, 3, 7 pretzel knot, then we have uh, 12 functions, fg and jg, j goes from 1 to 6. And we have to take the sum over all 6 of fj of gamma tau times gj of gamma 
Amazon Prime. Uh, Amazon, uh, sorry, Gamma Prime Tower. Well, here I just took the identity. Oh, sorry, I didn't put the Gamma Prime. You can also put a Gamma Prime base. Just moving. So then it's just C Gamma. Okay, it's easier. So here I can do the same. This thing will extend to all gamma, but it's a function involving two variables. And so it's some new kind of a cosine that I've been trying for a year and a half to make a well-defined cohomology group in which this thing would be a co-cycle. And I still have them, so there were various candidates, but they've so far all failed. So there's a much, much more subtle phenomenon going on involving tuples of functions. And that one comes directly from the quantum, uh, quantum theory of knots and three numbers. But that's the part I'll skip. So, and I start there. Yeah, thank you for that very interesting and entertaining talk. <laughs> and are there any questions? Yeah? When combining these two halves, what about the center point minus D over C? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I actually didn't look up the form in the paper. It's all those. We give the asymptotic, say, for S of both funds, but it's not continuous at that point. So, but that's perfectly OK in these models, even the usual models for Vs. There are various models like C infinity functions, piecewise C infinity. And if it's piecewise C infinity, it means there are finitely many, the tessellation of P1R, the finitely many intervals of which it's real analytic. And at the, uh, at the edges of the points where they meet, you might require nothing or, or some kind of weak growth condition. And then that's some other. So in representation theory, when you have a representation, it's sort of like I said about a group. It's not one thing. It's, it's lots of things. You might look at the C infinity vectors, the um, distributional vectors. There are many different things. And the group always acts the same way, but they're completely different from uh, Hilbert spaces. And so here you have to take somehow the right one allowing for some growth curves. No need, there is a technical point. As I said, I haven't actually gone through the proof carefully to check that this really gives the same cosine that we, we found. But it was, uh, it, it's a way, way simpler construction than the thing we did, simply by the silly idea of gluing together the left and the right half. We were completely stuck that you had a lot of half intervals. And they don't, the groups don't act on that. The group, it often sends one half interval to another, and then those two are disjoint, and you don't get anything. But if it's the whole. Real line minus finally many points. Let's go. Any more questions? Yeah. So yeah. you have now a candidate for a definition? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to. I mean, the, the <laughs> it's not an, it's not a mathematical object. It's a mathematical notion. We will say that a function has the quantum modularity property. If it's not strictly modular, if it's not invariant, maybe. Even modular forms, there are many, many definitions. If you define modular as f of a, ac plus b plus cz plus d to the k, you're already sunk. You can't do odd weight on many groups. Uh, you can't do characters. You can't do subgroups. I mean, you're putting characters, multiplying systems, all of these definitions. So we still call them modular forms. And then we also call Hilbert modular forms modular forms. I do not want to define modular forms as exactly a function on SL2Z with those. Of course, I can say that's a subclass. Quantum multiplicity is any function. So I'll say it in the most generality, which makes sense, like a Russian mathematician can say the first example where it's uh, not completely trivial, like a, sorry, like a French mathematician. Now, to, well, like a Russian who always takes the simplest example. So now I have some space and some group, <coughs> some discrete group acts on it. So you might think, uh, Gam is a discrete group for Lie group, and uh, X is you know, key mod K. Okay? So a usual homomorphic form would be F of gamma X is equal to F of X, but there might be an homomorphic factor, but actually you want to on the group, and then it's that's invariant on the group. So it's just a function on G modulo gamma. And now what I want is that that's not the case, but when I take the difference for every gamma in the discrete group of F and F uh, slash gamma, that that one becomes more analytic. It has better analyticity properties than the original. That's my definition, but it's not a strict mathematical definition. So if the original function was not even continuous, and the new one's continuous, or even almost everywhere continuous, it's good enough. If the old one was not at all continuous, the new one is analytic, as in some of my examples, even better. And if, like here, the original one is holomorphic, the new one is holomorphic in a bigger domain, that's also. So it's, it's a notion of quantum modularity, but now to answer the question about quantum, the word quantum is now totally inappropriate, because quantum involves going to the rational points. 
and now I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring them. We're, we're looking at the other points. So it's completely the wrong word, but it's the same thing in Poland work. Rosa said, if somebody could think of a good name, you know, I once called them wannabe other forms, but they didn't sound quite right. Maybe we should breathe. Um, one quick thing, uh, people that got a chair from the room, please put it back, because we have to have, like, actually free Well, that's the chairwoman's <laughs> job. I can't resist you, the puns. Well then, thanks, son.